We're talking about this period right after the Civil War. But there's one thing we have not introduced yet into this equation that actually has been going on even since even before the two movements united in 1832. It's something that we don't see today in, in this decade as being particularly influential at all, and that is the publications that were being put out uh, by various leading men within the Restoration Movement. And by publications, I mean uh, magazines, journals, uh, periodicals. Uh, today, in the Churches of Christ, the, the only really big publication anywhere close to what was going on back then would be the Christian Chronicle and, and, and the Gospel Advocate. But Stone started very early a, a regular publication that set forth in printed form what he and the other uh, restorationists that were a part of his movement were thinking about, what they were thinking and what they believed. Campbell's did the same thing. For the Campbell's, you first had the Christian Baptist that they published in the 1820s, and then... Uh, that was replaced after they left the Baptist uh, by the Millennial Harbinger, which, of course, we haven't even spoken about the what's still to come in the in the 1900s, 1920s in the church when premillennialism becomes a uh, a major dividing issue among some churches and still is among some even today. But uh, Campbell was a premillennialist. And so was Stone. Almost every uh, Protestant Christian was at, at that time. And, uh, but, so, that, so these publications they came out with were setting forth in, in more calm terms, usually, exactly what they believed in reasoning from the Scriptures and reasoning from logic and common sense and so forth about why they believed these things were true and, and what they believed they themselves should do and what others should do. Well, uh, as the movements merged and then other issues started arising, whether it would be abolitionism or whether it's the musical instrument or whether it's the societies, these publications started to proliferate. Everybody that had the money and uh, access to uh, a printer or even would, as Campbell did, establish his own printing company, uh, were, were publishing these things to try to persuade others on, on, to their point of view on various things. And you might have caught it, those of you who read your entire book in chapter 9 uh, of the book, the title of that chapter is The Influence of Editors. And his first statement in that chapter is, it has often been said the Restoration Movement has not had bishops, it has had editors. <laughs> in other words, in, you know, in, in old Europe, even the Protestants, often it was the bishops who were fighting these things out. Well, in the Restoration Movement, it was the editors who were fighting out these issues between themselves and their publications. And, and yet, right now, we're sort of in a lull. By now, I mean 2018. We're sort of in a lull in that, in the churches of Christ. I, I would like to say that it's all moved online, but that's not even actually true. There isn't any one or two very large, very influential uh, online websites that, that many members of the church would go to to see what people are thinking and what people are saying right now. It, it, it's just a different time entirely. Uh, but from the early days of the Restoration Movement with Stone and Campbell right up until the, 18, the 1980s at least, publications w yielded or wielded actually, or wielded a tremendous influence in the the Restoration Movement. And, and many of them have come and gone. Some have been around a long time, like the Gospel Advocate goes back to before the Civil War and still being published. 
The firm foundation started about the time of the Civil War, and it finally ceased publication, I guess, in the 1990s. And the Christian standard goes back to the, about the same time as the beginning of the American Missionary, Amer the American Christian Missionary Society in the 1840s, and it's still being published. So some of these journals are still around, but they don't uh, you know, exercise nearly the influence over the minds of uh, many of the members of the churches, whether whichever part, branch of the restoration movement you're a part of, like they once did. But we still need to acknowledge not just their existence, but their power and influence. This is how much of uh, the discussion, argument, fighting, even dishonoring each other uh, would sometimes take place. Some of these guys were real firebrands and didn't show nearly as much Christian love as I think they ought to have done and uh, called each other all sorts of names and accused each other of all sorts of things and uh, you know, claim that they knew exactly what you were thinking when you said or did that, no matter what you could claim that you were thinking at the time. And, but but it's very powerful, the, the power of the printed page during all of this great period of time. But like, yes, sir? I think uh, <clears throat> that since we live in a very polarized society, mm -hmm. let me specify a little bit more. Since we are very much in a, a institution where you know we get enriched with the Word of God so much we're constantly breaking things down we're constantly looking at context context we're constantly um, in a sense prepping ourselves um, to defend and contend for the faith we got to be very careful not to let that spirit of uh, pride Mm -hmm. uh, arrogance. Even when you know, like you know the truth, but if, if if you don't know what I know, and I know you don't know it, and I hear you say something, you know people can sense when you're just all you're doing is just listening to them, merely to break them down, merely to expose them, merely to, to show them where they're wrong at. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And you won't be effective even with the truth that you actually have. So we gotta be very mindful of that. Yeah, I think that's, that is correct. We, there is a tendency uh, among any of us, I would say, to when we're so totally, thoroughly convinced we're right, to not give the other person the benefit of the doubt. And that I may even say something a little further on today about that because I grew up in one, one fractured part of the restoration movement then moved over to another part myself. And the... The way I was treated at that time, I have no bitterness about it at all. I think it was the right thing to do. But uh, nevertheless, nevertheless I, I've had some experience uh, with that uh, from those who once called me brother and now who do not call me brother. So, But by the 1880s, two different views were evident uh, in the church. There were those who emphasized liberality toward what was called innovations in order to maintain unity. In other words, they would argue that it's okay, instrument or no instrument, society or no society, pacifist or not pacifist, uh, take any other issue you want, uh, open membership, closed membership, one cup, many cups, they, they just take any and all of them and say, uh, unity is the most important thing and we can have all this diversity in the church. Each person needs to be guided by what their own conscience tells them they believe the Word of God is teaching. And then there was this, the other group who were emphasizing staying as close to New Testament practice as possible even if that meant the loss of unity even if that meant having to divide with those who were not committed to doing that and their practice was taking them far away from what uh, this group saw New Testament practice as being. 
In other words, what's happening is fewer and fewer people are in the middle. More and more people are clearly on one side or the other in this. And the, again, the journals, the magazines, the publications were a big part of rallying people to the different viewpoints and winning people from this middle ground. So much so that in 1906, when the U.S. Census was being taken, uh, I believe the man would, uh, and can't actually quote me on this, I'm working from memory here, and not very good memory, but I believe he was uh, actually the head of the American Christian Missionary Society. He was the president of it at the time. He was actually contacted by the government, by the Census Bureau, and asked, is it true that there's now two different groups that once were considered just one and uh, he after you know measuring you know thinking the best way to respond to that basically his answer was yes there are those who are uh, you know instrumental and support uh, separate organizations, and then there are those who do not. And the, the, that group, the one that support the instrument and, and societies and so forth, was by far the largest, numerically. And so in 1906, the, at that time, the, they still ask you on the census, you know, what was your religious preference? Baptist, Methodist, uh, Presbyterian, Catholic, whatever. And starting in 1906, it showed up. You, you, could, you could say disciples are churches of Christ. And recognized as two different groups. So the fracture had already taken place long before that. Right. That's just often seen in 1906 as the, the time when our own government acknowledged it existed. That, other, than, other than that, it makes no difference that it was 1906. It had already happened. Well, meanwhile, within the disciples, this part that is instrumental, mostly society, uh, supporting mostly, they're still having their own battles. Even though they're one whole group, they're fracturing again within themselves even at that time. And it became much more evident in the 1920s after the end of World War I, though the war had no... Uh, influence on it so that in 1927 for the first time the more conservative disciples conducted their own separate annual conference from the re the other conference that had been going on since probably the 1860s or something they had a separate conference of their own 1927 and that's often viewed uh, unofficially at least as when the disciples divided among themselves into the independent Christian church and the more liberal disciples uh, church even though even though they were now having two different conferences they still continued mostly to have a lot of fellowship and interaction with each other all the way into the 1950s before in the 1950s uh, some things happened and I'm not even fully aware of them because I'm not a part of that part of the movement uh, that sort of cemented once and for all this fracture. But 1927 is often looked at as the date when that fracture within the disciples took place. Meanwhile, here's the, the, the churches of Christ, the non-instrumental, non-missionary society, non-Bible society, mostly in the South, but not entirely, churches of Christ. Uh, they're having their own struggles. In the 20s and 30s, it was uh, several things. Uh, the, probably the biggest one that stands out to some people is the, the teaching of premillennialism. Uh, truthfully, if we're honest, the vast majority of uh, members of the Restoration Movement up until then were premillennial in their view because that was a common view of all Protestants just about in America, just like most of them still today believe some form of it. But then, uh, I'm not even sure what precipitated some changes, but one of the men who stepped to the front and was a, a strong opponent to the premillennial view was a man by the name of Foy E. Wallace. In the 1930s, started teaching, preaching, publishing, 
uh, in the journals uh, the reasons why he did not believe that's what the scriptures taught. And now uh, the majority probably of churches of Christ are non-premillennial because of the influence of men like him. What was his name? Foy, F-O-Y, and last name Wallace. And uh, so that was one big issue that came out in the 30s. Another one that had already been coming along and continued was uh, this idea of, of no Sunday school. That's how it was often been phrased. Until then, most churches, again, truthfully, most churches in the Restoration Movement, going all the way back to Stone and Campbell, did not have separate Bible class times. They just came together for worship. But in the 20s, there was uh, a man, and, and let's see what his name is. You don't often hear it mentioned anymore. Uh, Jesse Sewell was his name, who actually uh, started a Sunday school program in the congregation where he was at, and it was so successful and, and successful by that, I mean it actually helped the church increase in attendance because it allowed uh, people to come and their kids have something to do besides just the adults. And, and uh, they even started using their Sunday schools as an evangelistic tool and so forth. And that other congregations started adopting that and then there were those who opposed that. They ended up being in the minority of churches of Christ over time. But there's one congregation here, at least one here in Lubbock today, the Quaker Avenue congregation that is still a non-Sunday school group. Though I don't know if, the, if they still hold that as a matter of doctrine so much as just a matter of, of uh, tradition or, or common practice. Yes, Brad? So prior to this, was this a foreign idea to all the denominations? Uh, it, Sunday schools actually started among some of the denominations. I think we might have even mentioned this back last Wednesday, week and a half ago. About in the 1850s is when it started up in them. But most of the Restoration Movement churches and most actually Protestant churches uh, did not go along with that idea. Didn't didn't go with that uh, for probably another 50 years. And then more and more of the denominational denominations did, then eventually it came over into the Restoration Movement, maybe in the 20s, and when we really start seeing an emphasis put on that, then a, a great opposition to it. And so the church fractured, and, uh, some, and again we're back to the thing, some of them fractured not just over the Sunday school, but also whether or not you, you had a full-time supported preacher, and whether or not and when you did communion, whether you just used one cup or many cups, and so you'd have all varieties of that. Those who were no Sunday school but had located preachers and used multiple cups. And you had those with no Sunday schools, no located preacher, but multiple cups. And those who had no Sunday school, no located preacher, and only one cup. And other var variations of that, even among themselves. And uh, then those like the congregation I'm a part of here at Sunset, we're Sunday school located preacher and multiple cups. We, we're all three. And uh, of course, the majority of churches of Christ are at the present time. But still, they often say your greatest strength is often also your greatest weakness. And our greatest strength of emphasizing being New Testament Christians and just like the New Testament church also open up the arguments both for and against all of these things because we're speaking in areas where the New Testament is actually silent. We don't know about ch whether churches had full-time located preachers or not, whether they used one cup or many cups, and we don't know if they had Sunday school classes or not, or if they did or didn't, whether that is vital to talking about new being a New Testament church or whether it's like talking about having a songbook or not. Yes? Can you think about it from a very... Um logical standpoint and connecting with your audience <clears throat> if you were to take a message or a teaching and you know it's challenging for adults to understand what you're teaching surely um, those who are youth are not going to understand it's, it's too complex mm -hmm. right and so I think when you talk about 
what is beneficial for reaching people and understanding it's a real sense if you do have to break things down according to the age level because you got a comprehension level right mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think we missed the fact of you know how does the youth and children see us as adults fathers and mothers live out our faith right and, and live in community with one another like that's a context where youth and family mm -hmm. go together but if but if i'm trying to teach if i'm really if i'm ministering and i think that somebody who is five six seven eight right you know what i mean or a teen i think they're really going to grasp what i'm trying to teach you as an adult they're, they're, we, we can't be we're fooling ourselves if, we're, if we think well, I'm just going to, hey, just because we don't see Sunday school or directly teaching this age group, mm -hmm. it's not in there, so oh, we're just going to have it with us all the time. Okay, now, excuse me, I'm going to be sarcastic, and I'm not putting yeah. it down at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spoken like a good Sunday school guy. Huh? But, but th that argument has no effect on those who were opposed to Sunday schools. They, they have a whole different set of reasons why they didn't right. think you should. Uh, they would argue, for example, it's the parents' job to teach children, not the church. That's true. And when you create a Sunday school, you've created an organization separate from just the because church means the called out. Right. And 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 the church comes together as the called out. But now, if you break us up into separate groups, right. then you're you're somehow breaking up the church. Do I agree with that argument? I don't. Right. But. You know, again, another, they're, they're... That's another reality that yeah. the fathers and mothers mm -hmm. aren't discipling their children. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, maybe out of that, it came to... Sure, and that's the kind of discussions you will end up having with, with some of these sisters, brothers and sisters, but realize they have, in their own mind, good reasons right. uh, that, that seem compelling to them. And... Uh, but yeah, again, our greatest strength is also our weakness. That's, that's because there are all these areas where the New Testament is silent. You know, and even when we take you know, one of the statements by Campbell about you know, whether the Bible speaks, we speak, or whether the Bible's silent, we're silent, that's not exactly what he said, but that's a pretty good paraphrase of it, and that's how it's often said today. Uh, even that doesn't quite work as well as we'd like for it to. Uh, we can speak with all authority on those things where the, clearly that's what the, the New Testament says <laughs> about things like the nature of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, uh, I think even what baptism accomplishes and the, and the form of baptism, if you want to use that term to describe immersion. Uh, I think that's all very clear. Uh, but there's all these other areas that are at best in the gray area, not clearly delineated out in the New Testament. And I think God chose for it to be that way. Now, did He choose for us to be so fractured as we are? No, I don't think so. And yet, by Him choosing, I'm not blaming God, but by Him choosing not to reveal more specifically than He did, He knew in His infinite wisdom that it would lead to differences. But is what do we do with those differences and what differences really do make a difference and which differences shouldn't make a difference um, between us. Yes, sir? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I guess I had a question because okay. I, I, I don't come from a church background, uh -huh. really. Um, you know, I just recently, probably within the last few years, I've studied the Bible for years, but <clears throat> recently, the last few years, I've come to mm -hmm. church Christ and all that. So, whenever I hear people talking about, like, separation because end-time eschatology is not on fleek, and mm -hmm. um, whenever I hear about like people like separating over missionary societies and things, it sounds like super. I don't. It sounds petty, and I'm just wondering like, are these really issues that that we really need to take into consideration when we're thinking? Well, I think I might fellowship with this brother or not. Like, is it, like I'm being serious. Like, yes. You know, is are they things that like? If you don't believe in, in the preterist view of revelation and like it's already occurred or the historical view or whatever, are these things that, well, I mean, I know they have separated, but are they worth it? Mm -hmm. I mean, because from what I read in First 
Corinthians and all that, and a lot of other books, that God hates division. He's always wanted unity, but there are core essentials. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know. I, the reason why I ask is because I have brothers that hold the same views I do, but they're like premillennialists and stuff. Mm -hmm. and we kind of came to the conclusion that, hey, if you believe that Jesus Christ is going to really come back and set a thousand year kingdom here on earth and you know that oxes and lions will be chilling together and eating grass, hey man, that's cool with me. You know, I just, I don't know. I just, I, you know, and that's, I guess well, that's my question. Well, what I hope that all of us struggle with is the very thing you're talking about is that we all, whatever we may believe on these things or over time, we may even, some of us, change our views on things. Uh, but that we be committed to what are really the essentials, most of all, and then let there be as much as possible charity or love yeah. toward those who genuinely are convicted differently than we are on some of these other issues. After the World War II, you know, so many of our people and many of them members of the body of Christ, you know, Churches of Christ, Restoration Movement people, and by now, we've narrowed our focus down more just to the churches of Christ by now. Uh, go to war. And maybe they were believers when they went. Maybe not. Makes no difference. Uh, but they apparently were not pacifists because they were willing to go serve. But they see a whole new world out there. They see Europe. They see Asia. They see all these people who are lost, who need the gospel. And so after the war is over, men like Klein Payton, Gerald Payton, uh, Truman Scott, and a long, long list of men and women none of us have ever even heard of, but who saw a lost world out there want to go back and carry the gospel with them this time instead of a gun. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there was this great surge in evangelism after World War II. And that's, that's where the Paydens got their beginning. And, uh, and of course, eventually... Uh, even Klein says, I'm going to start a school to train more men to go. The only reason I'm not going myself is because I can stay here and train a hundred men to go instead of just one man to go me. And so that began Sunset. And many other schools started up the same way. And some of them still are existing. But uh, so with this great vision for world evangelism again after World War II, uh, churches said, well, what's a, how are we going to do this? You know, we're not a big enough congregation, wherever this congregation is we mythically are talking about here. We're not big enough to support a, a, a man or a family or a whole team to go to Japan ourselves. So let's invite other congregations to participate with us in sending them. We're not going to create a missionary society. We've already decided that's wrong. We've already divided twice over that. But uh, we can still, you know, we'll be the, the, uh, the overseeing church or the supporting church and the other churches can just send their money to us and we'll make sure the missionary that we've all agreed together to send out gets that money, is taken care of and all that kind of thing. And if things go terribly wrong on the field, our elders will make sure that they're brought home or the issues dealt with or whatever. And about the same time, because of what they saw overseas, more and more organizations were created to take care of orphans, not just overseas, though that's where they often began. Orphanages, uh, the Paydens started an orphanage in Italy while they were over there doing evangelism in the late 1940s. Orphanages were started in Germany to help the, the orphan children of parents who were killed in the war. Uh, same in Japan, other parts of Asia, the Philippines and so forth. And uh, the same approach was taken about how we're going to finance this. You know, it's too big a job for one church to do, perhaps. So one church says, well, we will, we will be the, the contact church. And, you know, send your money to us. We won't take a, even a dime out of what you send. We'll make sure it all goes to help. And orphanages were started in the United States uh, even before that time, but they started proliferating in the late 1940s and 1950s. And so... But now some brethren in the church start saying, hey, that's not how they did it in the New Testament. Hmm. Each church sent their money straight to the need, not to some other church for their need. And so a new controversy starts arising. 
And if you're in the mainstream of the churches of Christ, those people ended up being called often by the term anti. Because uh, they're against it. Uh, they call themselves uh, conservative and called those who did differently, who actually pooled their money together, many churches and supported missionaries or orphanages or old folks' homes or whatever, they call them liberal. Sometimes, you know, the terms you use uh, end up shaping your thinking much more than your actual thinking does. And uh, I grew up in an anti-environment. My parents became Christians when I was five years old. Uh, all but one congregation in my hometown were uh, these conservative type churches that did not pool their money together with other churches to support missionary work or uh, help the indigent or the needy or anything like that. They each did their own work and if there was a missionary that needed more funds than one church could provide, then he just had to go visit another church and arrange for them to send money directly to him. So this church sent him a hundred dollars a month, this church sent him fifty dollars a month, but the money never came together anywhere except at his bank account. And, and these, these uh, churches, uh, like I say now, are often referred to as non-cooperation uh, churches or anti-churches among themselves. They would just refer to themselves as conservative and the others as liberal. That's where my parents became Christians. That's what I grew up in. Uh, after I went to Rice University to be an electrical engineer, then I wanted to enter ministry. So I went to the one college that, that at that time and still does hold to this position or this view about this cooperation and that's Florida Christian College in Tampa, Florida. Oh, yeah. What did they do? Uh, they, all the men who were there and are there now are opposed to this form of cooperation. So they would, they would be considered an anti-school. Uh, but that's where I went and uh, that's where I was taught and uh, you know in my hometown uh, they actually published one of the leading publications at that time that supported their champion this view called the, the Gospel Guardian. Again, notice the terminology and what that communicates. Uh, yeah, protecting the Gospel. And then a second publication started up called Truth Magazine. Does that somehow imply nobody else has it? I don't know, but... Uh, the, the Guardian has ceased publication now. Truth Magazine still exists and it still advocates this point of view. Uh, we have, I guess, a, at least a couple of congregations here in Lubbock who are a part of that fragment or segment of the restoration movement. The church down here on Indiana Avenue in about, what is it, about 66 in Indiana is a non, would, we would say a non-cooperation church. They would bristle at that designation but they'd know what we meant and there's at least one other in town as well I think uh, Kingsgate or Kings Park maybe that's what it's called and uh, and uh, but that that's what I grew up in and of course I went to college uh, got a I feel like a, a good Bible education educated by the same men that educated Richard Rogers Abe Lincoln Ed Wharton and so forth and Doyle Gillum who then came here when Klein started this school and became our instructors but they were educated, in part at least, there at Florida Christian College like I was. Well, then I go out and start preaching, and I'm going to preach just what I grew up believing and what I was taught in college. But the more I preached it, and to me, the less I could defend it. Mm. And so I finally reached a point where I said, that, you know, this is, you know, I'm not saying whether it's a person's wrong to believe that. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying... That, I don't believe, that is justified by what the Scriptures say. So I moved away from that part of the, the Restoration Movement in more of the mainstream part of the church. And that, and that and, was, and that was um, you know, in regards to giving or supporting mm -hmm. missionary. Yeah, um, and, how, and how that money was gathered together and sent to him and provided. Like, hey, if, it was, if, if we all collectively from one body with mm -hmm. different fellowships, right, mm -hmm. or, you know, it's okay to say, hey, you can pitch in, we can pitch in, we can pitch in, and get it to yeah. this, this brother out here on the mission. Right, that was you know, even when I think about it, if I just you can take a very, very uh, basic example, um, the church that's in um, Crest, Texas, mm -hmm. 
Mm. It's ten people, brother. You know, and I know Sunset has connection, has rapport, has or they can actually facilitate this this uh, missionary who's in Brazil, let's say. Mm -hmm. It would only make sense. Sometimes we get we get all caught up in how it's being done instead of is the goal being accomplished? Is the missionary being the needs being met and is the gospel continue to go forth in that city? Mm -hmm. You know? If that's the case, man, we so how we think sometimes yeah, well, you know, and obviously those those brothers and sisters who are still my brothers and sisters and yours too, yeah. they have very strong convictions about that, and uh, you know, and it, it's long ago reached the point where they are in separate congregations from us, and if we have events here at Sunset, they don't attend. If they have events at their congregations, we don't attend. We don't even an announce that they're having an event, much less attend. And so, you know, it's going both ways in terms of us no longer treating each other as if we were brothers, even though we may, at least on one side, still give lip service to thinking they're brothers. We don't act like it. So, but again, this, this is the challenge of being a part of the restoration movement. Uh, I'm not trying to justify this. I'm just telling you this is what has happened and this is as much as possible. You know, history is, is a study of significant events of the past and uh, explanations of their causes and sometimes their results as well. So that started up in the 50s and uh, some men who had pretty strong convictions about it, one of my instructors at Florida Christian College and a personal friend of mine most of my life until he passed away even was a man by the name of Roy E. Cogdale. Uh, he conducted m several debates with men on the other side of this particular quote issue about cooperation among churches and how that should be done. And uh, yet, uh, uh, he was always a gentleman. In fact, uh, they actually had a series of debates for several nights in my home, my original home congregation where my parents became Christians uh, in my hometown. They actually had a series of debates between him and a brother named E.R. Harper who was helping advocate uh, at that time, something they had down in Abilene, and it's still sort of there, but it's different now. They call the Herald of Truth. I don't know. It, it's now goes by a different name, mostly, and they do things differently. But E.R. Brother Harper was a strong advocate of that and participant in it and so forth. And uh, the funny thing is, they'd get up there and you know, in this debate-style format, they would have each night, and each would. Uh, make their strong arguments for their case and accuse the other one of what they believe is going to lead to this or it is causing this and so forth. And yet what you wouldn't often know is that they actually arrived at the building together after having had dinner before the debate and coffee because they were lifelong friends. They just strongly disagreed on this subject. <laughs> and after it was over, you know, if you only went by what they said in the from the podium, you'd think these guys consider each other almost mortal enemies and that each, that each one of them thought the other one was going to bring the end of the world. And yet, that was not at all the case. Unfortunately, the next generation of men after them, that kind of cordiality, gentlemanliness, and love, and personal uh, care for each other doesn't exist because once they separated to the point where they no longer associated with each other, no longer knew each other, now it was just about what they believed or practiced that was the whole issue. And they didn't let personal feelings get in the way, <laughs> if you understand what I mean by that. And, and when I started moving out of that movement, you know, eventually there were at least a couple of different articles written uh, partly about me in Truth Magazine and how I had departed from the faith and fallen away and, and uh, so forth and no one should have anything to do with me and so forth. Even though no one ever even contacted me about it. Wow. No, no one ever even talked to me. You never responded? What would I say? <laughs> anything you say only to make it worse. But, but what, what I came to the conclusion in my own mind is, you know, back when I had been in that movement, uh, I'd actually seen people who had been part of the cooperating churches uh, struggle with whatever things and somebody had studied with them in the 
non-cooperation group and convince them that it was wrong to be doing that and so they would come over and join us and so when they would do that we would say you know what intelligent people this is you know they've studied the Bible for themselves they've come to this conclusion and now they've left them and come and joined us well I did the same thing but I just went the other direction you know I studied the Bible for myself I didn't let someone else tell me what it said but I wanted to see it for myself and so when I gradually left that movement and went over here, now I'm an apostate and fallen away for doing exactly the same thing. A guy going the other direction while I was going that way did. And he was, you know, a lover of truth and right with God and all that. I think we all need to be careful yeah, yeah. about ascribing to people, uh, you know, things that aren't true. I know there are some people who do things for less than noble motives. But, but I want to believe when uh, someone who's a part of the body of Christ sincerely believes differently than I do on a subject. And I'm not just talking about an average member of the church that maybe has never gone to a Bible college and the only religious book they own in their house is a Bible. I'm not talking about those folks. I'm talking about uh, men and women who have devoted themselves to knowing the Word of God and teaching it to others when they have ended up believing differently than I have on some particular thing that, that I, I think is less than the absolute essentials. Mm -hmm. They're therefore suddenly saying they, they apostatize, fallen away, aren't right with God and aren't my, are not my brother or sister. Mm -hmm. mm. Give them a little uh, credit for being just as honest, hopefully, mm -hmm. and, and lovers of God as you are. Yeah. even if they ended up in a slightly different way. If I read Romans chapter 14 right, that's what we have there. That's right. We have some brothers and sisters who were strongly convicted that they ought to still be keeping the Sabbath day and the other holy days and that they should not eat anything, any meat that came from the marketplace unless they knew exactly that it had never been tainted in any way by idolatry. And then there were those that had no issue with any of that. I mean, uh, beefsteak, bring it on, you know. Holiday, which one? We don't, I don't celebrate holidays, holy days in any particular way. And yet Paul said each of them stands or falls before the Lord, not before each other. That's right. And what needs to exist between each other is charity and what will promote the greatest uh, benefit for the other person, not for myself. I don't want to fight an argument, I mean, have an argument so I can win. I only want to have an argument with another person if it's genuinely going to help draw them closer to God. And if it's not going to do that, if it's just going to create more you know, division or hard feelings, just don't have that argument. Let's acknowledge that we believe differently on that and we can share our different points of view on it, but we, we don't have to, you know, because when you start having these strong debates and arguments, there's just no way to divorce your feelings from that. And what started out just is that I think the scriptures teach something different than what you think ends up being he's rejected me or he's saying I'm wrong and I'm saying he's wrong and, and uh, so suddenly your emotions and feelings are involved and a lot of things happen that the Lord just never wanted to happen. Right. And it's unfortunate, brother, because neither of these things uh, brought us mm -hmm. salvation. Now, but I mean, I mean, yep, particularly yep. like it's not whatever you decide in mm -hmm. regards to how to conduct something, how to go about mm -hmm. something. Um, those things, it didn't. That didn't shed blood. Right. In fact, the sins and bring you in the unity with God. Yeah. You know what I mean. So we separate from a lot of things that didn't, didn't, um, didn't bring us salvation. And of course, what we're seeing now in the church that was in the 50s and 60s. That's when those battles were fought, unfortunately. And of course, uh, the church has moved on from that into two different groups and we're fractured from each other. But now what, of course, has moved into the churches starting in the late 1990s and becoming more and more evident as more and more churches again with the instrument, you know, the musical instruments come back around again. And uh, each one of us as ministers of the gospel and even as members of the body of Christ are going to have to decide how are we going to handle that in our ministry and, uh, you know, our service to God and, and not just how we're going to handle the instrument, but how are we going to handle our relationship with those who end up thinking differently than we do about it. And yet we consider them good, 
honest Bible students who want to do what's right with God but generally have come to a different point of view than we have on that. Yes, Brad? Um, you mentioned two of the three issues facing the church today. The third one that I was curious is if it's in the restoration movement is the discuss of divorce and remarriage. Yes, that's been, that's been something that more and more has, uh, some have seen as a real issue and, uh, and others feel like that battle's already been fought and uh, so forth. So, uh, you know, there's all sorts of things that still go on in the church and uh, about these and other little issues that might just be an issue in a certain congregation or uh, whether that certain men are qualified to be elders because uh, this man, you know, his first wife died and he's remarried so he's not the husband of one wife anymore or he's only got one kid instead of multiple kids so he doesn't have believing children, just a believing child, you know, and it goes on and on and on. But again, our strengths often also can be our weakness if we just focus on that one principle that we're trying to be as, you know, restore the primitive New Testament church in all of its practice and doctrine. And that's not mixed with the rest of actually what made up the New Testament church, which was a strong connection to Jesus Christ as our common Lord and Savior and a strong love for each other. Yes, sir? I guess the, the question was, in the story of restoration, they don't discuss it at all. I'm wondering if, if throughout the history that you've been studying, uh -huh. did that ever come up as something that they misunderstood or that they divided over? In now you're talking about the other uh, frag major fragments of the restoration movement? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I just don't even, uh, what you're saying is what I've observed. I don't see them even talking about it. I don't see that they've ever even talked about it. In e either the independent Christian churches or in the disciples movement about divorce and remarriage as an issue. And uh, truthfully, it hadn't been such an issue even in the churches of Christ as it is now up until probably the 60s. Before that time, it wasn't made so much of an issue. Everybody had very different views on it, even before that time, but they didn't hold that as a cardinal point of fellowship or not, like it has now become in some places. So um, let's, let's take a moment. Let me tell you a little bit about what we do know happened over in the Disciples Movement. I said, you know, 1927, they started... Out, within the disciples they started having two conferences one for the conservatives and one for the more uh, innovative group Why uh, innovative? Innovative. I love it. <laughs> well they that because again uh, language you use communicates a point of view innovation is what the conservatives called it the the those who were practicing the thing just called them expediencies but the you know uh, I've had more contact with uh, those who are in the more conservative part of the disciples than I have with those who are in the, the other group, the disciples group as they now call themselves. So I, I tend to use the terms they use. But, uh, so in 1927, but then in the 50s, some th other things happened that finally caused the more conservative part of the disciples to draw the line in the sand sort of and say we just cannot be considered a part of them anymore. And part of that was the, the more and more liberal theology was coming into their schools and were being taught to the men who would go out to preach, inclu including teaching that the, the Bible is not literally inspired in the way we've always said it was, that the, the virgin birth of Christ is not a reality, it's a myth, and that the resurrection of Jesus Christ in a bodily form didn't really happen. That's actually taught in some of the disciples' schools now and has been being taught for more than 50 years. And along with that, uh, their American Christian Missionary Society, and, and by that time they've created many other organizations as well in addition to that one, uh, urges them and their leaders are urging them through their conferences and so forth that they want to become a, a part of what's called the World Council of Churches which is a, a pan-denominational organization that says the emphasis needs to be put on meeting the social and physical needs of our world rather than on the theological and religious needs of our world. 
let's don't emphasize the gospel. Let's emphasize, uh, you know, clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, housing the poor, and so forth. And they've got a point. Christianity should be a part of doing that as well. But if, if you're not putting the gospel first, even in that, then after all is said and done, they, they will pass from this life and pass into eternity still lost, most likely. But again, realize that in the more liberal segment, theologically liberal segment of the disciples, they've already stopped believing in salvation in any way like we do anyway, and the blood of Christ and the cross and all of that. They, they, they've become much more humanistic. And so that's when the disciples divided into, once and for all, the in, independent Christian churches who are very similar to us in many ways, except most of, all of them use a musical instrument and they do still have a missionary society, though not a very powerful one, and an annual conference they put on. But in many other ways, their views about divorce, marriage, and all of that, elders, congregational polity, all of that would be very much like us. And uh, so that's, that was a, a situation that we were pretty much untouched by because we were already so separated from them. But if you talk with brothers, older brothers, that are still part of that uh, segment of the Restoration Movement, that's still a, a very sensitive issue with them, just like other issues still are with us. If you go download the latest set of notes off the website, I put those up about 12.30. At the end of the notes for today, I put a list of some key people down through the last 200 years now of the Restoration Movement that, that you ought to know about. Not know about in the sense that you're going to be tested on them, but you ought to know something about some of these people. Some of them were editors, some of them were evangelists, some of them were heads of organizations. Uh, one of them was a president of the United States. He was a gospel preacher who became the president of a Bible college and who ended up eventually as president of the United States. James A. Garfield. Now he was with the disciples. Hmm? Garfield. He was, he was with the disciples side even in the 1880s. So he would be considered more, not theologically liberal, but you know, he was more supportive of musical instruments, society, and all of that. But uh, still a member of, uh, of the church, uh, which, by the way, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson was also a member of the Christian church his entire life. You didn't know that, President Johnson. And uh, Ronald Reagan uh, was, was baptized in a Christian church when he was a young man. Later in life, did not stay close to the Christian church, but that's where he started out. So, but, you know, some lists of some of these key people and, and some of the key publications. The first two listed are, are not magazines, but they're the things that sort of define the early days of the Restoration Movement, the Last Will and Testament of the Springfield Presbytery and the Declaration and Address, which is a much longer document written by the Campbells uh, as they were pulling away from... Uh, Presbyterianism and eventually Baptist thinking as well to be independent thinkers. Then the rest of them are mostly uh, publications down through the years that have had a powerful influence on our movement. And then there's the, co the colleges. The first college established in the Restoration Movement was Bethany College, founded by Campbell himself. Uh, who was that that was telling me that's not very far from where you grew up? There you go, Ben. And... Uh, Still there, I believe Bethany College still is a functioning uh, school. I don't know if it's now, I think it's still just college, isn't it? Not university, I don't think they call it. Uh, most of the others that started out as colleges or even Bible schools now are called universities like David Lipscomb University, Freed Hardeman University, Abilene Christian University, Harding University, Pepperdine University. Uh, the little school I went to is still a college, Florida College now. They've dropped the word Christian out of it. Uh, because they said it was unscriptural to call anything except the church Christian. So they, <laughs> they're consistent in one way with their theology. Uh, but uh, 
So uh, anyway, and of course some of these schools now, uh, like Pepperdine, has has got much less emphasis on Christianity as a part of it. It's now just a, a mainstream liberal arts university mostly, though it does have a religion department. But um, anyway, uh, that's that's. Uh, that's our family. I, I listen to a podcast every week by a guy who's a part of the Reformation movement, you know, going back five or six hundred years. Uh, I, for the life of me, I can't remember his name just at this moment, but he's a college professor at, a, I think, a Presbyterian uh, seminary. But he has a weekly podcast I listen to about uh, the history, mostly of the Re Reformation movement. And... Uh, and he always begins his podcast by saying, uh, this is our family, and this is our family history. <laughs> and, and that's what we've been talking about today. Now, starting on Wednesday, we're going to spend two whole sessions, because I feel it's like it's so important, talking about uh, the, uh, the text of the New Testament and how we got it. Because that's very much wrapped up in the first several hundred years of uh, church history. And we're going to uh, focus on that and so forth. But uh, uh, yes, the, we had the one brother that uh, had written about Barton W. Stone, wasn't it? And I've invited him, if he wishes, to uh, take about eight or ten minutes of our time on Wednesday. That'd be Gavin to tell us what he learned about Barton W. Stone. Yes, questions. I heard someone. Yeah. Yes, Edmund. Will you put the next series of notes earlier? Just me. <laughs> if you can. If you can I understand. I'm hoping that I'll be able to put them up earlier because truthfully during the first half of this course, I probably didn't know for sure what I was going to say until about an hour before I got here. That doesn't mean I was late in preparing. <laughs> I, I, I'm just like somebody said, well, if I don't have to turn in my paper to Wednesday, that gives me a little more time for editing. I got you. Uh, well, that's sort of the way I am with my notes. I've been teaching this material for 30 or 40 years, but I still, I'm still never quite happy with it. So Thank you. Thank you for but, your I, but I But hopefully I will get the, the other stuff up a little bit sooner, so the night before or something, you can download it, print it out, whatever you want to do. So, All right. Thank you very much.